All right, good evening. All right, you guys didn't disappoint. I told Tyler and Caitlin that you would spread out around the room and, and sit all over the place, so thank you for uh, proving me right. It is good to see you guys tonight. We are, we're going to jump in here. I'm going to introduce you to some friends of ours that I am excited for you to hear from this evening. And, um, and I know you guys are going to be blessed with, uh, with what they have to share with you all. So last week, we talked about who am I as a parent, and we just looked at this idea that God has called us to be ambassadors in the lives of our kids. And so the, the press was, how do we do that? What does Scripture say to us about, about our, the calling in our lives to be parents and, and all those things? So tonight, our friends here that I'm going to introduce you to, they are going to take that conversation and continue it, to continue it and really pressing in on... Okay, if this is the calling God has placed on my life, then who are these kids that God has given me, and, and how do I understand them, and then do these things God has called me to do? So they're going to connect some dots, I, I, I think, tonight for you guys that are going to be uh, really good. So who we have here tonight are Tyler and Caitlin Sullins. So you guys, <laughs> welcome them. Uh, you guys, if you know Blake and Amanda Farah, uh, right here, this is, this is Blake's younger sister. Uh, how long have you guys been in Bernie? I think I've known you guys for a year. Is that about right? Every time for Blake. Yeah. <laughs> uh, almost two. All right. So our yeah. meeting at Bernie Taco House then was, was it two years ago? Has it, it been that it long? It was. Oh, wow. All right. We like to hang out at Bernie Taco House. That's, that's where we like to meet up and come up with all these brilliant ideas um, about how to share. So they are both uh, Christian counselors, therapists. Like, what, what's the right title? What do, we, what do we call? I like that. Are those good? All <laughs> right. Blue. They have, they, they are count, Christian counselors. River's Edge is the name of your counseling group. Is that right? Do I have that right? right. That's right. All right. Um, and so we're really excited to have them here in Bernie. They're a, a tremendous resource for us as a church uh, and have become good friends of our church as well. So I'm excited for everybody to hear from you guys. I want to pray for you, pray for our group, and then let you guys have it, okay? Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this chance for us to be able to gather to continue to press into your word. God, we are so thankful that we can have confidence that your word gives us everything that we need for life uh, in our walk with you. God, whether that is just in our daily life as individuals, but also in our relationships as husbands and wives, uh, as we parent our children, God, your word gives us guidance, it gives us wisdom, it gives us direction. And so tonight I pray that you would speak to us. Um, God, thank you for Tyler and Caitlin giving of their time to come and, and share tonight. I pray that you would speak through them uh, to us tonight, the things that, that we need to hear. God, you give us ears to hear, and uh, that, God, our homes would be blessed as a result of what we cover tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, guys. Well, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a muggy Tuesday morning, 6.30 a.m., and um, I don't know about you, but at the time, I was not awake yet. We had three children under three. So maybe we were sleeping in until they woke us up. And um, <clears throat> Tyler, being the involved, playful dad that he is, woke up before me, hears some ruckus in the house, and so goes to check it out. And what, what he found, I don't think he could have ever been prepared for. Mind you, he's not a morning person, okay? So he's groggy, not sure. really in a good mood. Check. 6.30. Check. Opens the children's door, and our two-year-old boy at the time is just mopping his wood floors. The kicker here is that his sister's uh, training potty that had been in the corner looked just like a mop bucket. And so he took his Melissa and Doug mop set, 
dipped, mopped, dipped, mopped. And y'all, he had made it across the whole room by the time we got in there. We. I, I did not. I was not a part of this. Do you remember this? I've blocked out most of it, just to be honest. <laughs> because you may imagine, like, oh, it's just, just, just number one. Oh. But no. One and two are now everywhere. Weird. And, do you remember? On the wall. It was on the wall. Yeah. Like, how do you get it on the wall? I could have painted a better picture here. All this, all you need to know, guys, it was 6.30. He had just woken up. He was not prepared to handle this, and yet he did. He was gracious, as far as I remember. Um, and he handled it. I, I remember coming to his aid, taking the children. He cleaned up the mess, et cetera. But that began a morning full of inconveniences, okay? And what I remember about that day was that about two hours later, when the things just kept on happening, Tyler's level of stress was unseen to the children, but I obviously, I know he's this tea kettle that's just like about, about to blow, you know? And um, he was doing such a good job of suppressing it. One little thing happened. I think a child spilled milk on the counter. <coughs> And I looked over at Tyler, and he just said, much to everyone's delight, I'll be going outside right now. <laughs> and walked outside the back door. And I just, I, 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 I'm not kidding you, I took out my phone and I took a picture of him outside in the backyard through the picture frame window just because it was such a gift to me to have a husband be self-aware enough to know what was happening inside of him and maybe not be able to control it. The, the things that were happening were very stressful. They induced, he didn't want to clean up that stuff at 6.30 and then continually do the things that parenting required of him, but he did. So parenting for us, and, and I'm sure I see people at very different spots in parenting throughout the room, um, has the potential to just let us know what's inside of us is my point here. And I know Daniel's talked about this in the past, that parenting is this ground that the Lord's given us to, to give these children Jesus. But I think oftentimes that's a little messier than we're prepared for. So for tonight's purposes, all you need to know about Tyler and I um, is that we, we actually met on stage at camp. So this is really nostalgic and fun. Um, we our parents of three kids, and we have both been parented, but we were parented very differently. And I don't know if you want to talk to that at all, but I came from a place that I would say was pretty gospel saturated, both inside the house and out. And so I have this picture of what parenting can look like simply based on what I experienced. And Tyler's was less saturated with that gospel. <laughs> Would you add to that? I would add to that. It was like, if hers is a saturation, mine was a bit of a desert. And, and maybe you can relate, but it wasn't that we were anti-God, anti-Jesus, or anything like that. It was just there was no uh, formal thought at home. It was like mostly outsourced. You know, you, you, you take your kids to church, you sit in there on Sunday, and they go to Sunday school. Once a month, that was kind of the way it was for us. And so at home, we did not talk about God, the gospel, Jesus. So I had to learn it all on my own. Yeah. And anything that I did learn through the course of my life was picked up personally, independently, which has some consequences, pros and cons. But yeah, we were definitely not trained up in the way that we should go. Mm. We're going to be talking tonight about how the gospel changes how we parent, specifically the children that are in your home. And I just wanted to say that to say, we are two very different people, and no matter where you are in your parenting journey, it's not without hope, and the end result has not yet come. So I don't know what that looks like for you now. Maybe you have grandkids in your house, and you're watching your kids do it, and I bet that's real difficult. But Tyler, I'll, talk, I'll toss it off to you to talk about the gospel. Yeah, so if we're going to talk tonight about the gospel itself and how that we infuse that into parenting, I wanted to first get a baseline pulse on what is the gospel. I'm sure each of you have an elevator pitch that you use all the time, like gospel is fresh on your hands, but I will give you my version of that. So we have at least the ability to conceptualize what is the gospel. This may be a reminder because Pastor Jason probably brings it up every week and you're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to hear this anymore. That's perfect. That's probably the appropriate amount of time. So I'm going to tell it one more time. The gospel, the good news that Jesus 
has come and he's coming again. Simply put, broader strokes, God formed a relationship with Israel. And through that relationship, he gave them a law. They broke the law. Over time, there's these, you know, these whispers like, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, right? And then he did. Lived the life we couldn't live, died the death that we deserved, and now he offers us a new life through relationship with Jesus. So when we think about our parenting in light of the gospel, that's the framework. That's the framework that we're coming from, that the gospel is the good news of Jesus. I want you to write this down so that we have, we didn't give you any handout, sorry about that. Um, we're not as Not cool. sorry, it wasn't my plan. Yeah, we planned it the whole time because we're good like that. Uh, we're going to be covering a simple verse, and you can probably memorize it by the end of the night, tell it to your kids, uh, because our kids always come home, I don't know if yours do, and they always have memorized like one verse. This will be yours, Proverbs 22, 6. Um, and who can quote that? Is there any Bible scholars or Bible drill people here? Just, I'm not going to well, give it to you. I will, I will, but you, don't, you only get like five points. I'm giving you hints, people. Ooh, there it was. 20 points for Gryffindor. Everybody give it up for this man. Or I will. Yes, very good. Uh, train up a child. You want me to write the whole thing? Actually, let's... I'm just going to... We know. Yeah. Train. Say it with me. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is older, he shall not, will not depart from it. Easy peasy. Plop that in your old uh, pants because you're going to be able to use that throughout the night. Train up a child. First thing is train up. So when we talk about train up, we're really talking about channeling. And so if you're taking notes, write that down. We want to channel our children in the way they should go, but we want to, we want to, in, um, what's the word that you use? Initiate. Initiate. Initiate that training. So ultimately it's going to be channeled in a specific direction. I think all too often we can just sort of shotgun everything and be like, oh, maybe it'll blast it and I'll kill a bird or whatever. But we really want to go with a rifle approach in terms of training up your children. Because um, if, we, if we do the, the shotgun approach, we might be okay, which if you talk to Ken and Sonia Sullins, they sort of did the shotgun approach, like, yeah, we'll put them in front of good people and maybe it'll turn out well. It turns out, like, I'm not addicted to meth, so that's good, right? Um, probably need to know my story for that yeah. to be, like, kind of funny, but um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so in terms of a rifle approach, we want to be strategic. We want to be uh, initiating that training in a certain direction, uh, in train up, I have two points to that, right? Mm -hmm. Train up, ooh, I like that. So the Hebrew for, for initiate specifically says from the mouth of his ways. Yes. And that meaning the beginning, the, very, the mouth of the river, right where it begins, from the very beginning of their days, as small as they are, as silly as that might seem to preach the gospel to an infant, we are told to begin. At the beginning. Good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in the way that he should go. You were right there. It's up there. The way. The way. The way. The way that he should go. Uh, what's unique about this verse is that you can kind of take it to, two ways. Uh, and I know most of you are biblical scholars and sit around and think about multiple translations of scripture and different ways the Hebrew can be, you know, interpreted. But the, there's two ways that it come to mind and they're both helpful or both informative for us as we think about raising up children. One would be in the way he should go in terms of in according to his bent, in according to the way that he's wired or she, the way that they're uh, created, their personality, their giftings, their desires. So training up according to that. I think we want to keep that one in mind. The one I kind of like a little bit more, and I think it's probably a little more true to the text in terms of general wisdom and Proverbs is in the way that he ought to go, in the way that he should go, right? In the way that uh, would be best and beneficial for godly living. And so when we, in terms of training up in the way that they should go, uh, the end result is that they might not depart from it, that they may not depart from, it, depart from it. In fact, it's more likely that they won't. But as many of you may be knowing right now, even as you, does anybody have older kids? Any kids are out of the house? Any kids you're still praying for that they might know Jesus? Yeah. So is this truth true for every single person in every single situation, I got people I'm still praying for, right? This doesn't apply to every single kid um, in that it will ultimately, with a rifle approach, in the way they should go, according to their bent, you did it all right, and you're like, but that didn't, didn't work out. So in this 
case, we want to at least speak more with broad strokes. In general, Proverbs is a book of wisdom of how things are generally true. Um, in this case, I want to make sure I'm holding on to those people as, as like, there's, there's room for conversation about each of your family members, each of those people that are near and dear to you. But in general, that's where we're kind of landing tonight. The only thing I would add to that is James K.A. Smith has this the definition for discipleship, raising up disciples who follow Christ. His definition of discipleship is the rehabituation of loves. And so when we talk about what it means to train up a child in the way he should go so that he might not depart from it, the language speaks towards developing such habitual rhythms that he's walking in those steps, he can't depart from the steps. It's a, it's a habitual rhythm. And so we know God wants our heart, not just our steps and our doings, but the idea is that if we give them that path to walk in, they know how to walk in it. Boom. Okay. We're going to talk tonight about the what, the who, and the you. Caitlin's going to write that down. If you're taking notes at home, what, the who, and you. Did I get that in the right order? What does that mean? What, what? What are we asking? What? Mm-hmm. We're training up what? What are we training in them? Uh, who are we training up? And you, you're the trainer. We want to learn more about that tonight. So we're going to talk about those three things in light of this verse, in light of the gospel, that Jesus has come. And here's the main point of the gospel. is like, how does that change my parenting? Literally, if Jesus did not come back, or oh, sorry, if Jesus did not come, and we don't have the gospel. What we're doing literally right now is just a really silly hobby. Like this is this would be so silly. Like why not be out making money or playing sand volleyball or watching TV and just scrolling Fox and CNN and like this is really a silly hobby. But if Jesus came and he did die and he did resurrect, then that's all that matters. And so in terms of our parenting, we keeping that in the back of our mind that the gospel influences literally every single thing, how we go to work, how we play, how we talk to our neighbors. But in terms of parenting, if we're going to be God's light for the world through our family, then this is very, very important. Because if you think about Acts 1-8, go, I uh, know that Jesus' command to us is that go ye therefore in all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them everything that I've commanded you. Where does that start? Right? I think you probably gave a good context for that last week. Daniel is just, the home is the place where we are the ambassadors for, for the Lord. And so the gospel has to be infused in that because literally it's the only thing that matters. We have plenty of things vying for our attention, but the gospel is what truly matters. So let's talk about... Yeah, what? we're therapists, so we have to start with the you that is mm. doing the training. Kind how do you feel about it, where that? It's, how mm. do you feel about that? Lay down on the couch. Um, <laughs> Tell me about your mother. Isn't that what therapists do? I don't know. Not in our office. Um, <laughs> the you. So, I starting with the you I at won't the bottom. Go off script. Yeah, I, I like, like to do it backwards. Okay, this is we we know where we're going. Last week, y'all talked about starting with the end in mind, having a a big goal, right? Okay, this is where we're going tonight, and we're also talking about that big goal where we're going with our kids in hopefully very specific ways. So, pause. Daniel said you guys might shout out questions, or you might just say things at random times. I'm looking forward to that, by the way. So if it does happen, don't treat us any differently than you would, Daniel. Just throw it out there, specifically when Caitlin's talking, maybe. Oh, yeah. So um, as honest as I can be, I would say that I really felt like I had this together before we had children. Oh, you did. Thank you. And I'm not talking about my body. I mean just my person. <laughs> like, oh, my gosh. Yes, yeah, she is. She Thank does. you. My being, okay? I was doing okay in life, right? And, and, I mean, grew up in church. I've been following the Lord. For, I mean, he purchased me at such a young age. Like I said, I grew up in this home where my parents really did a pretty good job of um, bringing me to, the, to Jesus often. And so I kind of thought, you know what, I'm ready. I'm ready for parenting. Let's do this. And um, maybe your experience was like mine. But I had never had anyone spit in my face until I had a kid. <laughs> So to be fair, I didn't know how I would react when that happened. And it was new data for me. Oh, didn't know that was in there. I never was an angry person until now, you know. Um, I had never been as sleep deprived as having three kids in three years. And so I had no idea what was inside of Caitlin when my comfort idol was not being met. We chose that too. Like, why did we As do soon that? as we finished having kids, well, finished. Who knows what the Lord has. But we looked at each other and thought, what have we done? 
And, it, and I say that with all honesty. I really do believe that the Lord has given us these children as a heritage from him. I think that they are the greatest gift outside of his salvation and our marriage. They are my greatest joy. And they are emotional vampires. Mm. And they just <laughs> suck all of the energy. Um, and I think both can be true at the same time. But the reason we start with the you that is doing the training is because if we are to be Jesus with skin on with our kids, we are obviously imperfect pictures of him. And so I want to be aware of what is coming out of me, what is maybe getting in the way of being this reflection of Jesus to my family, to my kids. So part of walking down that road is knowing myself, my story, um, my sin struggle, my propensities for whatever. And so I have these, this is Mrs. Mason Jar, if you will. And this is Mr. Mason Jar. Yes. Yes. And as you can see, they're just filled with themselves, okay? They're What's filled in with yours? Stuff. Pom-poms. Well, in mine is uh, my insecurities. Oh, I see where we're my, going here. Okay. You Got see it. what I do there? Yeah. Keep going. Okay. In mine, I understand my mug a little better than others. I, in my mug are insecurities, my past history, maybe some traumatic things that I've experienced, my highs, my lows, my uh, winning. We didn't win the high school football championship. We were close. But it's fine. We were real close. If coach would have put so me Regrets. In, regrets are in regrets. there, too. Uh, and they're all in there. What's That's in yours? fair. Yeah, in here is all my past uh, relationships, my need to be thought of as awesome, um, my want for affirmation, affection, and approval, um, as well as really good things, right? But it's all mixed up in there together. And so we're going along just doot, doing our lives. Doot. And maybe uh, Mrs. Mason Jar hits a bump. <laughs> oh, my God. That was so loud, y'all. I'm sorry. <laughs> and Next a couple... A couple <laughs> Pom-poms fall out. Well, why, why did those fall out of Mr. Mug, Great Mr. Question. Mason Jar? Well, I would, I would, well, I would say because they're in there. <laughs> 100%. They came out because that's what was inside. And in the same way, he's going to hit a bump. Bump. <laughs> and his will spill over into mine. And mine might spill out into his. And it's just going to be messy, right? But not because we did anything wrong. Just because things were inside. So they came out. You can take my mason jar. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Mason Jar. Yes. So the point of that is that no one is immune. We can't actually be perfect enough to give this beautiful reflection of Jesus to our kids, right? All of our stuff is going to come out. I think I bring that up to say... Part of my journey in parenting and all of ours is being able to address those things that are coming out in a grace-filled manner with people that we trust and are safe um, without fear of being judged, I think. Um, for us as counselors, man, I sometimes wish people could have a... a like live feed into our home to watch us fight because it's not like oh, you said this and I felt this and now I'm we're not actually pretty good at it. There's but, a commercial where they like throw the flag and they're like, well, actually, and then they the red one. You know what I'm talking about? And then they rewind it. She knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> She's like, wait, well, wishing she had one of those <laughs> penalty. I guess I just challenge. say that to say part of parenting is addressing what is inside of us. It has nothing to do with our children. They are simply the ones that push the button that make it go, you know, no one spit in your face yet. It's going to happen and we'll see what comes out. And part of the journey of following Jesus and being sanctified, being made more like him is that addressing what's inside. So the you that is training are point one would be address the negative. Okay. That requires being honest about what's happening and then being able to talk about it with someone who's safe. Maybe that's a friend, maybe it's a family member, maybe that's a counselor, who knows. The other side of this is also in the same way that your children um, are of a bent, and when scripture talks about that, it's this, it's this picture of how a tree grows and bends. It's according to the tenor of their ways. Um, Explain that, because I, I mean, I understand that, but... <laughs> Of course you do. 
What is tenor? When I say that, I mean I am going to do my life in a different way than Tyler's going to do his life because I am different. And Isaiah 43.1, talking to Israel, says, I have redeemed you, I have called you by name, and you are mine. So identity is found in belonging, right? We are gods. We belong to him. But my design, how he's actually created me, is a little different than everyone else. So according to the tenor of his ways, is referring to maybe in a melody, we have the harmony, we have the one third up, one third down, and it makes this beautiful melody, this beautiful tune all together. Each of us have a, has a different tenor. I'll talk about it a little later. So pause, we'll come back to that. Teaser. Okay, so we need to address the negative, but the other side is <clears throat> I want, we want a parent out of our giftings as well. We'll talk about that more too. So address the negative. Don't be afraid of parenting out of your positive, okay? Yeah, and I think just to piggyback on that, knowing, knowing that information sounds really lovely, but like you probably aren't going to arrive at that accidentally because you're probably not thinking about it because if you're like us, you did just get spit in the face and you did just get called to pick up the kids um, because they just threw up. And you're like, when do I have time to go and just process myself? Like, like. When do you do that? Because your life is busy. I, I don't, maybe you guys can't relate because you have so much free time, but I don't tend to have all of that all of the time. And so if direction determines your destination and not your intention, I think all of us would intend on being really good parents that understand ourselves and are parenting from our giftings and we're parenting from our, not from our insecurities and our negatives. But where do you find, maybe we can speak to this later or now, where do you find the opportunity to reflect on yourself? Uh, perhaps... Literally, you're doing it right here. Yeah. Like, so go ahead and don't be afraid to give yourself a pat on the back because this room isn't full. There's other people who would, would benefit from hearing these things. So yeah. Yeah. I would say kudos. Like finding the time to do it is creating intention uh, because you're not just going to accidentally arrive to Dallas if you, uh, if you just start driving. I mean, there's a, there's a chance, but you got to get on 35. And nobody wants to get on 35, <laughs> but that's the way you get it to Dallas. Um, anyways, I think my, my only point to the, the you that is doing the training, my sister-in-law, Amanda, her, her kids are absolutely going to know how to have fun because they are her kids, right? She mothers out of who she is. Sadly, my children will know how to complete their chores and keep a clean room before we have our fun because they are my kids. And the chaos is stressful. So if you are a linear thinking engineer at heart who needs black and white, great. That is perfect. Let's parent our kids out of that bent and propensity, not try to be somebody that we're not, but be a less reckless version of ourself in health. That's a good word. Take it. <laughs> what are we training? So we know that you are doing the training. And I would even just piggyback to say, like, what a gift that the Lord's given us the children, um, whether our kids or our, our grandchildren or whoever we're parenting at this season of life or your husband or whatever. So you are doing the training. And so that is such a gift that the Lord has provided. Uh, but what are we actually training them in? Because we're going to do you. And then in good fashion, we're going to go up to the what. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about Shema, actually, because oh, sure. you do a better job with that? Um, Tyler mentioned that, okay, so <clears throat> in the way that it should go can be according to their bent. It can also be in accordance with righteousness. Proverbs is this book that's talking about conventional wisdom according to righteousness. What is the way of following Jesus? We look at how did Jesus teach his disciples? Because what you're doing in your home is raising up little Christ followers, little disciples of Christ. So what if we just look at Jesus' model? Jesus says, my first and greatest commandment is, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your might. Okay? The Shema, is, that's what that is called. The word Shema literally means hear, but it is a hearing with an intent of obedience. They are not separated. And so what we are teaching our kids, if we are doing what Jesus taught us as his disciples as well as his are to listen and obey. How many times in a day with little kids in your home do you say, listen and obey? Or, did you hear me? 
or did you obey? But that is something that I have adopted as a mom because I want them to know what it, what it means to listen, to hear God's word, and immediately obey right away, all the way. That is what he desires from us. So we, what we want to teach, we want to teach them to shma God. But the way they learn that is to do that in our homes, and you are their authority. So one, what do you teach them? Listen and obey. Do, should I give that back to you? No. Oh, yeah. Um, I Keep want you going. to talk on this, but <laughs> Jesus taught his disciples how to live life in his kingdom, right? And all throughout the Gospels, they are walking along their way, doing very normal things that they're doing, and he's teaching them these parables. He's, he's talking as they go along about what it looks like to live life in his kingdom that he's ushering in that is different than the kingdom that they are living in right now. And it, it, everything he teaches is upside down and seems so backwards to what the rest of the world is used to. So you, as a parent in your home, part of what we're doing is showing them that difference. Tyler's phrase is exposing the truth for what it is. Here's what you're experiencing in the world or you're going to experience, but here's what is actually true because you are a follower of Christ. Would you add anything to that? I'm running out of breath. You're on point. Okay, good. There was one more thing. Oh, oh, this one hurts me so much. Jesus... Jesus taught them to listen and obey. And, and ultimately, that means love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. He taught them what it looks like to live life in his kingdom. And then when he did that, gosh, uh, Luke 2 says that he was with them, and then he sent them out. And at the end of his ministry, after he's given them all he can, he gives them jobs, and he sends them out to do them. Without him, right, and he promises the helper, the spirit. But in, the, in a very similar way, eventually our children are not going to be in our home. And we can hope and pray that we have done everything within our power to give them Jesus, give them hearts for him, teach them what it's like to live in his kingdom. And then we're going to say, go. You have this job, go do it. Can you speak to, like, what that looks like in each kind of age? That kind of is the next? Sure. Well, actually, we could talk about the ways that we do that in our family. I think that's probably a little more practical as far as what we're training. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to do that with intention, right? Because we don't just fall into good living. Like, we may accidentally, but we're trying to do that with intentionality. And I think that's the biggest thing about the train up is we're doing it on purpose and not accidentally training. Like, yes, we're doing it as we go, but we're doing that on purpose. And so we're looking for these specific, what, what we call them, and I think it's also borrowed from... Maybe? Everything we have is borrowed. Yeah, yeah. None of this is copyright. You yeah. know, look it up. EGI, easily Googleable information. <laughs> uh, we're looking for moments, memories, and milestones. So, what are the moments? Those are going to be as you go, like while you're changing a tire. Uh, when was that? This week. It was either yesterday or the day before. I'm, that's, One day, thank you. <laughs> like that's a that's a moment to show your son how to change a tire, obviously, but also how to. Uh, to be poised in the midst of chaos, uh, acting as if you're, you're the fleshly version of Jesus for your kids. That's a moment. It's a teachable moment. Not, we have to be careful because not every moment needs to be like, pause. What is the Lord teaching us here? Like, okay, don't be awkward all the time. But if you're not being awkward at all, you're probably not doing it enough, so you probably need to back off rather than like ramp up. So if your kids aren't like, this is kind of weird, you may not be doing it enough. So just go ahead and, and Caitlin does it really well. And I don't mean she's awkward at all. I just mean looking for those teachable moments. I think for us, we got to throttle it back a little bit because we're like, okay, overkill. Our kids are going to like rebel against us because they're like, we're done with this Jesus stuff. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to throttle a little bit because I'm so aware of how little effort my parents took. I love my parents. And you probably love your parents too. But they are my model of what it looked like to train. And I think they did a poor job in this respect. Um, so as we, we try to do that with intention, that's where this came from. We're looking for moments. Uh, we're looking for memories and milestones. You know, talking about this memories. is Yeah, what Tyler's talking about is just if you need a structure for thinking about, look, I want to be intentional with training my children. I know where we're going. I, I know who they want to be. 
How do I actually do that? Let's break it up into very achievable sections. So think about your life. Moments happen every day. You get to choose them. Like he said, any moment can be teachable. Not all of them have to be. We'll talk about memories. These can happen less often, less frequently, but memories, um, <laughs> Tyler and I say that if it's just the two of us on a trip, it's a vacation. If the children are involved, it's a family memory-making opportunity. It's not a vacation. Um, it feels very different, but that is what it is. We are choosing to make memories as a family um, so that they can, one... You can relate. <laughs> experience what it's like to be in the Sullins family. I want them to have fun with us, to feel safe with us, to want to be with us. So let's go do great things together to make these memories so that they form this experience that is positive of what it means to be a Solens. And, and the good news is like we're saying, we're saying that that's the way we want to go and that's the memories we want to create so that maybe they will want to come back to us yeah. later. Yeah. And so some of you are sitting here going, Okay, I'm still waiting on that. Like, when do they come back? I was talking with Jason the other day, and it was like, when, when they're young, you you are in control of their schedule. They have to do what you do. As they get older, you have to take them to everything they want to do, and you're a chauffeur, and you you they tell you that they have soccer practice. You're like, I guess I'm going to soccer practice, and you drop them off. And so they don't necessarily, they're not dictated by you as much. So we're creating the best possible scenario that we can possibly do that they might go. I like you, you know, when they have the choice, you know. I guess I wanted to throw that in there because oh, that's great for the adolescents. We see a lot of kids and and, and adolescents too, and they're like, "You're all idiots. Uh, you're you're all <laughs> that's dumb." What they think, about they us. think that yes. <laughs> like our our littles do too sometimes, but they don't say it because they don't have that language yet. Because we're protecting them with what they hear on TV. Um, but I'm giving you that language because that's what they're saying in in our offices. But obviously, we're trying to coach them into like, well, they're not going to be idiots forever, and there's some good ways to think about this. Can we see it from a different perspective? And, uh, but yes, you're all, you're all really dumb. If you're a parent of an adolescent, we're not dumb yet. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Moments every day. I'll say this. I'm in this, right? I have three little still at home with me, and so moments can happen all the time. Some of my favorites are, are, are when the Lord gives me eyes to see in that moment. They are ripe for this, they actually have my ear. I can make this a moment. And when they are little, I will say this, we promote what we praise. This is a phrase I heard from a mentor a long time ago. This means, uh, okay, my middle is such a helper and I wanna instill in him that he can be a servant leader who helps. And so he had watched and made coffee with his dad multiple mornings in a row. Very important skill for a young man. <laughs> And one morning, I woke up, and he had made me coffee. He was three years old. And so it, I mean, it was horrible. There was coffee all over the counter. It was, uh, he had, like, sieved it, you know, three kettles for one scoop. It wasn't good, right? <laughs> but sweet. I wanted to kind of be like, oh, God, again, I'm like waking up at six, and this is what I'm waking to. But I had this in my mind. The Lord brought it to my mind, and I got to be like, Judah, you made coffee. You are such a servant-hearted leader. This is incredible. And y'all, his eyes poof, just shot up huge. Like, I am a servant-hearted leader, you know? And he's so passionate and intense. But I make these huge celebratory moments about what I want to encourage in them because really they do latch on. So you promote what you praise. So praise what you want to see. Maybe we'll create these, these children who thrive off of affirmation and approval and they will tackle that when they're older but this is how we actually create when they're young I'm in charge you're not do this because it's good not bad and then they learn it's because of Jesus memories we've kind of handled this is going to be different based on who your kid is right the memories I'm going to create with Judah specifically are way different I'm going to think about um okay I might take my daughter um, on a sweet memory, Tyler took her wildflower picking on Friday morning on a daddy-daughter date because that speaks to her heart. She just wants to walk in the woods and pick flowers and make up an imaginary world in which they live in and sing songs, okay? Judah is like, do let's just play basketball. And that's going to speak to his heart just as much as 45 minutes alone with daddy. He just needs to sweat out with him, and that's a sweet memory that they did one-on-one. -on -one. 
Miles Eli, Scott. Eli is through, his heart is through his belly, so we're going to get ice cream. Okay. Totally. <laughs> and hopefully not, yeah, create problems there. Milestones. This is what you can be super intentional in, in planning out ahead, right? Maybe a milestone for you is when our kids are five and they go into kindergarten. We really want to start instilling in them responsibility and freedom. So when you turn five, we're going to take you on a camping trip and we're going to talk about this, right? Or maybe it's, hey, we're going to go to Chuck E. Cheese because you're five and that's a big deal. But when we go home, you have these two chores. And when you complete these two chores, you have these freedoms. And that's a big milestone for them to experience this time with my parents and something came from it and something in my life changed. Maybe that happens uh, at adolescence, maybe that's 13 and you have a boy and you wanna say, look, you are entering into what it means to be a young man. And maybe for you, that's great. I'm gonna get my four closest guy friends and they're gonna tell him who he is or what it means to be a man. And we're gonna chop some wood together because that's manly. I don't know, but you it get to plan manly. out what your milestones are with your kids. And you, this, this goes into your bent. What is it that you think about doing, right? And what these things don't happen by chance. I keep saying that. This doesn't happen unless you're intentional. And so we just live in a culture where things aren't really rhythmic. Like when you're this age, you get to go out and kill your first boar barehanded or something like that. Like, did any of you have that experience? <laughs> He did, and he's laughing. Yeah, he's thinking, oh, no, it wasn't a boar, but it may have been a deer. Who knows? Um, if we if we want those things to happen, our culture isn't just going to naturally move them in, unless to say like, oh, when they're this age, you probably should get an iPhone. Like, okay, like that's not very cool. I mean, not in terms of teaching and training them in righteousness, which is absolutely want to do. And so these are all in the lens of if you want to potentially create a disciple of Jesus you got to be intentional, and this is sort of the rhythms of that. Mm -hmm. Big picture, when they are little, who in here has little kids, maybe five and under? A lot of you. Wow. Okay. Mm. When we are training little kids, the idea is you promote what you praise. Let's establish rhythms that provide repetition. And so... The and why is that? The, the neuroplasticity of our brain requires the repetition, and rhythms are easy for us to do. I am driving in my car every day, no matter what. So let me redeem that time. Maybe in your car you go, man, my kids don't talk to me. I'm going to turn the radio off, and we're going to talk. For me, the car is, the, is, is kind of one space to breathe. <sighs> but it's also a great time for them to learn scripture. So Steve Green has four albums of kids scripture songs and by golly my kids are going to know 52 verses that I didn't even have to work on with them because they sing a joyful heart is good medicine good medicine a joyful heart and you'll start singing and I'm, so, I'm kind of tired of hearing it but what I mean th that is a rhythm that happens every day no matter whether I, I try or not it just turns on when when I get in my car right and I want to instill these things in them so that it comes out when they get bumped, and when they're old enough to go, hmm, what do I think about that? It's already in there, and it's already changing their hearts. What else? I was, littles. I was learning. That was the littles. Yeah. Any, anyone in here have adolescence, like eight to, okay, great. Preteens. Pre yeah. Is eight a preteen <laughs> Someone now? say, ugh. Yeah. <laughs> eight to preteens. Um, the idea here is that you are kind of, you're moving from a cop Maybe, like, I'm promoting safety, what is right and wrong for my little kids. Here's the boundaries that you stay in. As they grow up, you're moving from a cop into more of a coach. It's a really weird line to have to cross when they're in that in-between stage, but they no longer want you to be in charge, and yet you are, but you're giving them the freedom. I, I have this picture of you're at an ocean, and you're on the shore, and up until they're five, they're just waiting and playing in the waves. But that in-between age, adolescence, eight to maybe, we'll call it 14, 15, they are out farther than you can actually reach them, and it's getting a little choppy. And so you're saying, come back. Don't go too far. I trust you, you know, but I don't. <laughs> Terrifying, but they kind of have to learn on their own. So the second part of having, having mids is what I would call them is you're, you're, you're always going to have a safe place to land for them. They need the freedom to 
mess up a little bit and pray that it's in small ways, not big ways, but then come running to you when they get in trouble. There's a, yeah, I have a little time. To, there's a restoration therapy is something that a lot of therapists are using nowadays um, with parents and, and teens specifically. And it's part of the research says that in order to create a safe space for someone to actually think that you are spa safe, they need to experience 90% of their interactions with you as being like in accordance with that feeling, if you will. All that that means is the more that you can say, hmm, be curious instead of judgmental. That's the best language probably that you, you should write that down because it's good for husbands and wives too. Curious instead of judgment, literally a, an argument we, we, had. we had. A, we had a good discussion the other day about being this Robust dialogue, we call it. So with, my, with kids, when they come to you and tell you what's going on, if they actually open up and share, right? As parents, all the red flags are going off, and you're like, oh my gosh, who said what? They did that? What are you doing in the bathrooms? Oh my, you know? Let's be curious before we're judgmental. So I am closing my mouth. I'm going, mm-hmm. And this is where the therapist comes in. Yes. And instead of asking very specific questions, I'm asking open-ended questions, and I'm, I'm waiting for them to keep talking. Because the more they can actually experience you as being on their team, someone who can hear them and not immediately insert themselves into that situation, again, you will have to train and coach, but give it a little bit of time so that they can be fully heard and feel fully known and understood. And then maybe there's a moment where we're like, hmm, let's, here's one thing, let's redirect this. Yes. Great. What's really cool about this is it's literally how the Lord made us to receive information. Um, guys, if you're into like really cool FBI books, you should read Never Split the Difference. And ladies, you can read that too, obviously. But I, you know, most men don't like to read books about emotions and feelings. But if you do, we have those too. Whole Brain Child is a good one to read as well. But literally the way the Lord made of our, our brain is if we, if we see something as threatening, what, what's the thing called? You'll know what it's called. Fight or flight. Yeah, that's a, little, that's a real thing. It's not just a conceptual thing that those crazy counselors and psychiatrists people talk about. It's literally how the Lord made our brain. So we want to hijack that or we want to hack it. So it gets hijacked and then we can't listen. We can't pay attention because we're looking for the thing that's supposed to hurt me. And so you have this eight-year-old kid who's got this thing and they finally say it or they get found out and then you become big and scary, right? Well, they have to retreat because they have to run away, they have to hide, or they have to fight back. And so you end up getting into a lot of battles, or you're like, my kid won't talk to me. Well, how do you talk to them? Well, like this. Okay, well, just note your posture. Note the way that you're approaching them, because you want to approach it the way you would a dog. You don't want to shove them into a corner. And, and to be honest, a lot of you do this really well. I'm just saying, in those moments where you're like, maybe there's something that I could do, it would be approaching them as if, you know, you're like, oh, cool, tell me more about that. And you're like inching closer rather than, you know, just walking up to them. Does that make sense? And so a good uh, visual for that is like, this is your brain. Everybody do this. And the top part is your prefrontal cortex, which is really right here. Uh, and we know all of yours are very fully developed. If you're over 25, it should be. And you're very smart and wise. And this is the part that helps to put the brakes on all the things that are happening inside of your body when you feel threatened. The, the good news for you is that if you get threatened, the top kind of comes up a little bit, uh, but you're, it's quickly able to apply the brakes um, to that gas pedal that says run away, hide, get away from this. Your younger kids in that middle school time, obviously younger as well, two-year-olds are kind of like they're all really crazy, but as they get a little bit older, their brain's still under construction, bottom up. They're being formed from the bottom up, literally their spinal cord from up. And if there's any nurses or doctors in here, please just confront me later of maybe how I messed this up. But bottom up. So we want to start bottom up when we're approaching them about anything that might be confrontational. So being curious rather than judgmental is not just a nice thing to say. It's actually approaching their brain in a way that they can hear the information. And a cool trick that we tried is called the radio DJ voice. Do you remember that? Yeah. Would, would you mind showing everybody how to do that? I do have a <laughs> and I have the microphone. Uh, the radio, was anybody a late night radio DJ? Any of you for college? Nobody? What is the late You're night? You're surprised by that? <laughs> yeah, well, no. Like, 
You got to make it through college somehow. The late night radio DJ, welcome to K-Love 98 on your college campus of choice. We're going to play Shania Twain. And oh, wow. yeah. Somebody mentioned that in session today. I was like, who goes to a Shania Ch- Twain concert? Anybody else? Amanda. <laughs> Deaf ears. Uh, the late night radio DJ voice is very helpful when you're being curious and you're not being threatening. Late night DJ, it actually communicates to your brain in a way that's a low decibel that ends up allowing you to receive the information, which is pretty cool. FBI negotiators use it, evidently, to make terrorists give the babies back and give the kidnapped kids back. So if it works for those terrorists, it might work for the terrorists in our home, right? They're all kind of trying to ruin everything. So, Tyler, practically, what would this look like when a kid is blown his top, feels threatened, yes. angry? Mm-hmm. It's called staying in your window, okay? There's a, there's a marker. So much on here. This is where we want to be. When you're trying to talk to your kid and they just found out their g- girlfriend broke up with them or they got caught vaping. Nobody's kids vapes in here, but uh, let's imagine that they did. We want them to stay in this window. We also want us to stay in this window. This is hyper. I'm just going to be quick with this one. And this is hypo. We don't want them to get too agitated, frustrated. We want to get them too shut down. We don't want that for ourselves either. Remember, you're doing the training. If you're not aware of your own emotions and stuff, you're going to get outside of your window. You're going to be too agitated, frustrated, irritated. And what's going to happen? Their little lid is going to flip. And their amygdala, anybody heard that word before, amygdala? Look at you. Come on up. No, I'm kidding. Uh, Your amygdala is going to get... It's going to send all the signals to the rest of your body to shut down, to pull away, and to fight or flight or freeze. And it's not going to be actually helpful that you're like, well, what do you think about that? Was that a good idea? And like already they're like, no, it wasn't a good idea. This is awful. They're shutting down, right? They're not engaged. They're not talking to you. So we don't want their lid. Everybody remember? Your lid. We don't want it, we don't want it to get flipped. We want it to stay intact, which literally what that means in terms of what's happening in there is blood's not going here. Where do we want it to go? Here. To the brain. Because that's the brakes, right? We don't want to be all gas. We want to press the brakes. So if you come at them, like you come at me, bro, that's what they're saying these days. Uh, are they? I don't know. But they might be. Uh, we don't want them to feel like you're coming at them. We want them to feel like you're a safe person, which that's why I hijacked everything you DJ just said. DJ voice makes there you go. them feel. It makes them feel a little more safe. And like, I want to give them more information and they're going to, they're going to be calm, right? And we're going to be able to resolve not every conflict because some of you are like, I've tried this. It doesn't work, right? We're we going to try a lot of different things. This is one of those tools you can put in your tool belt. Radio DJ voice, mm-hmm. soft, K-Love, 98.5. Delilah, did anybody ever listen to Delilah? <laughs> yeah, you are speaking my mom's language, Sonia Sullins. I think, yeah. So curious, not judgmental. Stay in your window. I, I love hearing him talk about this, and I just want to give us the reminder that God made us this way. He is aware that there's this window, that we have emotions. He gave us the chemicals in our brain that cause us to happen. So this is connected in deep ways to how does the gospel change how I parent? Gosh, he made me. If I can understand what's happening inside of me and keep this perspective that this kid is not the threat, they're not in charge. Also, Gosh, the job he's given me to steward this gift calms me down sometimes. If I can, if I can keep that perspective in t- heightened moments, we can keep moving slowly forward. I'll wrap up. Littles, we said you promote what you praise, rhythm, repetition. Middles, they're in that past the bay of security, and they're in the jetty of adolescence, if you will, and it's very uncomfortable. But you're going to be a safe place to land and then you can create freedoms and responsibilities. They are old enough to know what is required of them and what freedoms they have as a result of accomplishing those requirements. If we don't accomplish what we are required, we don't get the freedoms, whatever that is in your home. Maybe that is screen time. Maybe that's uh, time to play with friends at home after homework is done. If we don't get our homework done, we can't have the friends over. I'm on your team, I want your friends over. This is your job. Let's do it first, then this can happen. Decide what's important in your home. And then if you have big kids, gosh, I'm not there yet, um, 
but I think one of the largest jobs that people have told me is that you put people in your place. Because I do know as a counselor at about 13, they stop listening to us. They just turn their ear off. Um, and some of us get Not the privilege. Totally, but yeah, I was gonna say, some of us get the privilege of having kids that, that keep listening. Um, but the biggest things my parents did for me was continually put people in my path that were people that I wanted to be like. And it just so happened that they were people that loved Jesus fiercely. And they were cool. And I certainly thought they were cooler than my parents, you know? Um, and my kids are eventually going to think I'm not cool. And that's such a bummer. But I'm going to find some really cool young college kids who love Jesus and hope that they follow after them. Or it may even be some of your kids. Amen. Oh, if you do it right, you know. Think about it. And at that point with Biggs, we're moving from the the coach to a consultant role. role. Um, You do your life. I'm here. I'm on your team. But we're transitioning out of the parental role as is normal, and we're moving into more peers as they get older and older. We can talk about that real quick and then wrap it up and hold some space for maybe a couple questions. Yeah. Um, You know, the who that I am training... It's a, it's a big piece. The big question there is, do we know our kids, right? Um, to have more language here, you could think about um, being able to describe your kids in different personality tests. If you've heard of um, the Enneagram, maybe it's easy to read about that and know and watch your kid live and go, whoo, that kid is a seven, and that means a lot to me, and I can understand them through that lens. Uh, maybe it means nothing to you, Right. Um, but there are a lot of different personality tests that can help give us language to be able to describe this person in front of us. So I, I can watch my kids live, and I can tell you my, my girl is an INFP, hardcore. And because that language means something to me, it's really easy to understand her. So any other personality things you would add to that to give us language? Mm-mm. No? Okay. Um, Do you use this one. Knowing your kids means knowing what they're not as well, not just what they, they are. So if we try to parent with broad strokes, broad strokes, we might end up hitting the spot. Um, but if we're so narrow and thinking, well, that's how my daddy raised me and my, that worked for them, you know, you kind of just do that. I'm just doing what they did kind of deal. You're going to miss the mark as well. Like you, it's, it's like you're trying to hit in a, a nail and you're trying to get them to listen. You're trying to get them to do what they're supposed to do, but... It wasn't a nail. I mean, it was a screwdriver. So switch the, switch the tool, and you might get a different result. Obviously, doing some of the brain stuff helps, but at the end of the day, talking to our oldest is way different than talking to our youngest. Or imagine your oldest and youngest or whoever you're parenting right now. Like They're just different people. But if we don't take the time to be intentional, to know who they are, not only that you are made in God's image and you are God's workmanship and you're all of the good things that God already says about them, he also made them and wired them in a unique way. Ephesians 2.10 says, We are God's workmanship, his poema, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he has planned in advance for us to walk in. And I, we really believe those good works can be very specific according to their bent. So like Tyler's saying, maybe your kid is in a world full of hammers and they're trying to be something they're not. And we need to give them the language to say, you're a screwdriver. That's not who you are. Um, The more we know our kids, the more we can speak the identity to them. I even think about how God created Adam in the garden, and his first job, I believe, was to speak identity to the animals. He literally gave them identity through his words. He called that out. Girls in the room, I don't know how, if that gives any indicator for you, a man's words to me mean so much, even if I don't want them to. But if someone has told me something about myself, it sticks. We are made to be creatures who accept and receive identity. We better make sure that we are getting it from the right place, i.e. scripture and what God says about us. But as a parent, you get to see how your kid is made and give that to them. And that can sound like character words. It can sound like... um, Distinguish that from uh, performance. I might need your help there. Oh, okay. Instead of you do this really well, it's you are this. So... um, Talk to me. Give me some character. I'm needing some. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm. Um, You know what? Performance-wise, Tyler, you are a really hard worker, but I notice (coughs) in you. (laughs) No, that's Um, But I know what's true of you is that you are um, intensely motivated by responsibility, and you you are someone who thrives when given leadership responsibility, and you need to walk in that 
always look for opportunities to do that, right? If I were to say that to him. Um, I'm imagining you as my five-year-old daughter. Um, girl, people follow you. I don't know if you know that, but people follow you no matter what you do. So let's make sure we're, we're leading them to Jesus. Um, yeah, what else? That's good. No, yeah. no, no. The difference being, rather than calling out performance, the things that they do, well, man, you nailed that, that pitch they threw down, you know, all across the plate. Like, you did well. You did a good thing. You performed well. What are we reinforcing? We promote what we praise, right? So go hit more balls, um, do more BP, whatever, and that's the bat baseball language. Anybody have kids in sports? They're not here. They're at you know, baseball, maybe. They're at but... baseball, obviously. <laughs> uh, we promote what we praise, so we want to praise character so that that was a bit more universal. It kind of spreads out a little bit farther than just, okay, mom says I'm really good at painting. I need to go paint more so I can get more praise from mom, right? I'm not saying that they're strategic about that, but most of what they learn is more caught than taught anyway. And so just note, what am I promoting? I'm promoting godly character, right? So that I can create this disciple or am I promoting really good doers of things and they become a little more pharisaical. So yeah. side note. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for ways to know your kid, we found that one of the best ways is to have one-on-one -on -one intentional dates with them, doing something that you believe they might thrive in. I told somebody that the other day and they're like, that sounds they said stupid because I said the word date. So you might want to come up with a different word than that, but intentional one-on-one -on -one hang times mm -hmm. is a good one. Um, we, we also involve ourselves in places where people are also speaking that identity to them, obviously being at church, uh, but you're the primary voice they're going to hear in their life for a, a lot of that. So what am I specifically wanting to call out in my son or daughter in this season? And making a big deal about that. We go to a camp that... Uh, they actually make a little like, medallion. A, a medallion. Like it's it's like this thing where they go, oh, you are humble, or you are you are gregarious, or what's the yeah <laughs> bad ones that they make sound good? You can make, even make your <laughs> negative this, this quality. wild child that won't be quiet. He's so gregarious. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. another one though too. Like, uh, anyways, even the things that you look at your kids and go, man, they really struggle with that. There's a way to call out the truth in the midst of that. You are long-suffering is a word. But the reality is like they're in a bad relationship with a girl who they just can't get rid of because they're so insecure and they're, they're arm candy and they give them a safe place, but they're really awful to them. You are long-suffering, Fido. I don't know, his name's Fido. That's a dumb name. That's a dog's name. You are long-suffering, Tyler. So we can still call out those truths. You're loyal. And you are rather than... You do, right? So that's the point. Yeah. Landing the plane, the gospel changes literally everything. If not, this is a really silly hobby, and you could all be doing better things. But if the gospel is true, that changes everything. It changes everything about your parenting. But we don't just accidentally wind up being good parents. Many of you are a result of many of these classes, many of the things that you've been pouring into yourself, because you got to be a, the best version of you that you can, and there's many ways to become a, a better version of you, so that you can instill the gospel truth, that rifle approach. Like, I really want to train them up in this way and not just shotgun. It's time. Thank you. And know who you are, know who they are, and know what you're training them in. I will, I will say this, too, in closing. The gospel changes everything, right? Because the gospel is true, because the news that Jesus came and, and accomplished everything for me on the cross that I sometimes try and accomplish being a mom, it literally means I'm nurturing life in the face of death. Like that changes how I make breakfast in the morning, you know? Because I do know who these kids are and, and, and the big picture, so... Mm. And that is the bell tolling us to leave. I will pray. We'll be available up here for as long as they'll keep our kids. And it seems like Jason's and making his way Jason up Jason will come up and pray because he is the pastor. Give it up for Jason. <laughs> Jason! Oh, I got one. I got one. Awesome. Will you guys give uh, <laughs> Tyler and Caitlin a hand and... Really, really good content. Uh, I pray and, and know that you were edified this evening. Uh, like they said, they, they will be up here for uh, questions. Uh, and, and if you, uh, this is recorded, so you can go back and watch it online. It was, it was fast coming at you. There were 
certainly moments that you resonated with uh, and might need those notes. So we post this online. You can go back and, and watch it, share it with your friends. Uh, and uh, again, we're, we're in week three of like six parts on parenting and continuing to, to, to drive down deep. Uh, if you have questions for them or if you have questions that you want uh, uh, Daniel and I to address next week and the following weeks, just uh, as this is, is really scratching an itch, let us know in that regard, all right? Let us uh, uh, pray. Again, thank you to the Sullens. Um, Rivers Edge, they, they just changed their branding. Rivers Edge Biblical Counseling here in Bernie. Highly recommend. Uh, we use them and refer people to them uh, for biblical counseling. Uh, ju so just know that, that, that they have our trust. And uh, again, you guys did an excellent job. Thank you for that. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and kindness to us, uh, that the gospel is true, the gospel changes everything, um, and so many incredible points of, of wisdom uh, and truth of life uh, uh, that were expressed tonight uh, through Tyler and Caitlin. And so we thank you for them. Uh, and, and Father, we pause right now to, to just declare uh, how much we need you in our journey of being parents and uh, how the truth of the gospel and the grace that's available to us and the fact that your spirit goes with us and helps us along the way and, and is continually changing us. God, we hold on to that truth. Uh, we deeply, deeply want to see our children know you and walk with you. There's no greater joy than to see that. And so we want to pass the gospel down. And so we pray for that wisdom. Uh, help us to be intentional. Give us the strength and the perseverance to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.